Hi, welcome to Region 3 Fall Educational Session, our first one. Um, I am Sue Hoffman, the Secretary Treasurer of Region 3, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our session today. It is titled Utility Applications on Narrowband Internet of Things Networks over Upper 700 Megahertz A Block. Um, thank you to our sponsors for this Region 3 Fall meeting. Our premier sponsors are RFL Hubble. Walker and Associates, and TBC Wesco. Our gold sponsors are Burns and McDonnell, Sienna, and Select Spectrum. Now, let me introduce Keith Woodall. He is the Director of Business Development for MIMO Max. Uh, Keith's role is to support utilities to form a solution design and implement a wireless communications network enabling the transport of all field applications, SCADA, DA, DERMs, and gateways for future IoT systems. Thank you, Sue. Um, all set on this end? Uh, well, uh, hopefully your job as a moderator will not be as challenging as uh, Chris Wallace last night. So thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, presentation. I'm, there are some really great things that are occurring within the 700 megahertz arena. And I'm, I'm, my objective is to provide a, a view into some of that. So just as a quick introduction, I've been providing solutions for utilities for about 20 years, first with Moto and then with SNC Electric. Um, so had a, I've seen a lot of great things that have occurred within uh, field area networks for utilities. A little bit about MimoMax. In 2007, we were a spinoff of Tate Radio our international headquarters is in Christchurch, New Zealand. We have regional offices in Phoenix and Portland. And our focus is pro providing private licensed narrowband fixed solutions, communication solutions for medical mission critical communications. So uh, field area networks, uh, they're really driven by the application. And as I mentioned, um, my experience with utilities, I've seen quite a bit of uh, variance between utilities and how they solve the field area network challenge. Um, I've seen utilities build three separate networks, one for SCADA, one for AMI, and then most recently adding in distribution automation. I've also seen utilities uh, try to attempt distribution automation over the AMI network, which is not advisable. So what, what is the um, really key driver why utilities are doing that? And it's really the uh, lack of spectrum to be able to build comprehensive networks where you're able to control the performance. Um, and most recently with the in introduction of distributed energy systems such as wind and solar where power flows are multi-direction it's going to increase the complexity of field area networks and hence their requirements. So <clears throat> the lastly, the Internet of Things, those specific communication requirements have not been fully defined. So it really creates a challenge for uh, the utilities. So MIMOMAX, what we've done for utilities when they are uh, going through their grid modernization is provide a comprehensive field area network solution. And the primary characteristics of our solution is you have the ability to tier it to specific applications. We offer the most spectrally efficient radio on the market at 16 bits per second per hertz. And it enables you to build a reliable, robust, and uh, secured network out to the edge, the grid edge. You can build high capacity where, where required and also support low latency, as well as in, uh, adding on the systems that don't have the capacity or the latency requirements as well. And the other great thing about our solution is you can scale, scale it to support the entire service area, and we even have statewide deployments. So let me dig into the tiering just a little bit more uh, and give you a visualization. For SCADA, distribution automation, and distributed energy systems, where you have that low latency, high capacity requirement and that 
peer-to-peer uh, -peer messaging that is a, uh, a must, you want to put that on the tier one. You're, with our solution, you're able to do it with a full duplex radio. We can support layer two and three, uh, the VLAN, so you can implement the quality of service. Um, our systems have the ability on a sector basis to scale to 1.2 megabits per second. That's all in narrowband channels. On the tier two level, uh, you want to support things like cat banks or the residential solar or even the up and coming IoT. And uh, a really nice feature that we provide is the ability to do um, plug and play uh, with GPS positioning. And you have the ability to do routing on as well. So, what we have found with our customers, it's really critical in, um, in this. Uh, spectrum to be efficient uh, with the frequency because you're more than likely as you um, your capacity and scaling um, increases, you're going to have to have frequency reuse. So what we've seen are 14 channels or minimum for a, a large geographic area. That enables you to support the current requirements as well as future growth. And lastly, we uh, also uh, recommend that you have some spare channels for inter interference mitigation because that will occur in pretty much any spectrum that you utilize. And what we've done is we've come uh, upon a cellular style deployment uh, with our sectored antennas to be able to support the utility requirements. Our platform, um, primarily, we have on a tier one, it's our uh, tornado radio, it's optimized for the capacity. It's full duplex and supports up to, up to 256 um, QAM modulation. Um, and then we do that with spatial multiplexing. And as I mentioned earlier, you're able to support up to 1.28 megabits per second on a sector. For our tier two, we have the Pixis radio, and this is where you want to scale uh, your field devices in the magnitude of 100,000 plus devices and devices. We have a lower modulation that's available on this platform. And what that enables the, the network to do is uh, be tolerant to interferences which may come into play. You're going to have um, higher latency and lower throughput, but again, it's, it's set up as by design to support those systems that don't require that communication. And I did already mention the plug and play. Uh, so it's very easy to deploy when you have the numbers of devices that you're, you're putting in the field. So quickly, I wanted to go over one of our case studies, uh, SRP, uh, third largest public utility uh, in the US. Obviously they're um, based in Phoenix metro area and they provide utility service, uh, power, water, and telecommunications to over 1 million customers. And the, as I mentioned, the scaling, we uh, scale up to 13 square miles, 13,000 square miles. And doing that, we've um, 48 base stations with the three-sectored antenna, antennas with redundant radios, um, are supporting this communication network. The tier one devices include ground mounted uh, uh, DFA switches, SNC interrupters, and commercial solar in, um, uh, inverters. And with the lower tier, we, are, we have built out 1,250 base stations and we're supporting cap banks um, and on, which are based on light poles and uh, the applications are the residential solar as well as meters and 12,000 KV switches. And that is a quick uh, view into the solutions that we're offering in the 700 megahertz arena. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Um, Robert Pinch is the president of Select Spectrum. 
Uh, George Lucas is sales director for Lowy Inc. And Kimberly Trailer is director of network and telecommunications for JEA. Our speakers have pre-recorded their presentations today. So now we are going to watch this presentation. And after that, we will have them with us with a live Q&A session. You can submit questions to our speakers at any time using the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Hello, I am Bob Finch with Select Spectrum, and I have a small portion of today's presentation. You're going to hear a lot more uh, from Kimberly Trailer and George Lucas about the actual application uh, at JEA and about the technology. Uh, my role is really mostly an introduction uh, and a little bit answering the question of, uh, you know, why, uh, what's special about NBIOT and why is it something that the owners of these licenses, Beachpoint Capital and Access Spectrum, have been pursuing um, with with a lot of uh, activity uh, from Select Spectrum as well. So uh, briefly, my, as I said, this will be a quick presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about existing solutions. That's not the focus of today's presentation, but I think it provides a good backdrop. I'm gonna ask, you know, why would we add LTE narrowband IoT? And the answer for that is really, it's an increased range of applications. So for those parties who've looked at 700, this is a whole additional reason uh, to consider uh, different types of applications. Uh, in most cases, there's not direct uh, crossover from some of the wideband applications that have, have been done before, but there's a lot of things, as, as particularly as you'll hear from Kimberly, about uh, about the types of uses that can uh, occur uh, within utility space. Um, briefly, I'll talk about the RFP and how we selected Pololi, and um, uh, they've just done a super job for us. So um, you've all seen this before. Those of you who've attended these regional meetings before, we hold the uh, upper 700 megahertz A block uh, in about two thirds of the country and about a third of the country, it has been sold to critical infrastructure companies. It's good for fixed or mobile. It sits between Verizon and AT&T FirstNet. Uh, there's plenty of uh, equipment out there in terms of amplifiers and transmitters and, and antennas and, and all of the, the key components of radio systems are produced in high quality, uh, quantity and quality because of the, the neighbors here in the band. It's been recommended by UTC in a white paper. And these are the many companies uh, that have uh, selected this spectrum for use in their operations. Um, and, and you'll see uh, National Grid, First Energy, uh, some major uh, players here, Centerpoint, uh, Encore, all using the spectrum. In your region, uh, Power South is the leading customer. Uh, we certainly want to add to that list. So um, we encourage you to, to consider these NBIOT uh, solutions as well as the, the other solutions that you've looked at in the past. In terms of the geography, uh, this will show you the dark areas, uh, dark blue areas on the map are what have been sold. Uh, so as I as mentioned, about a third of the country. Geographically, it's more than that, actually, because now Alaska is held by Andas. Andas is uh, more of an equipment company uh, manufacturer, uh, and they use uh, IEEE uh, standard equipment. But uh, they also hold the licenses in the Gulf and in, in Alaska. So I imagine they have designs on the energy markets as part of their uh, their services that they are planning to offer. But more generally, this has been acquired by electric utilities uh, for a range of applications. And uh, you can see that uh, in the Southeast, uh, we have a long way to go. So we uh, certainly hope uh, that this NBIOT will be of interest. Uh, overall, uh, by the way, this, this spectrum uh, was uh, renewed uh, so all of the areas that you see in light green or, or dark blue are renewed and available, uh, well, renewed and available in the case of the green and uh, renewed and in the hands of other utilities or critical infrastructure companies in, in the case of the blue. So uh, we have now another nine years available on these licenses since they were just uh, renewed last year. And the owners are uh, certainly able to uh, work with you they're anxious to sell the spectrum. They're looking to, to accomplish exactly that. 
All right. Uh, in terms of manufacturers before the NBIOT, there are quite a few already uh, servicing uh, in the upper portion the data market uh, for critical infrastructure companies. Uh, you'll see there that a um, uh, wide range of solutions, including AO216 standard, the so-called known, known as Gridman, uh, and, and including a variety of, of uh, industrial quality, high, high capability systems uh, from companies that are used to selling into your kinds of markets. It's also available for land mobile radio solutions and then uh, for UAVs, right, for drones. Uh, there are systems available from three different leading suppliers. So quite a bit of, of solutions already. Uh, these tend to be wideband, um, relatively low latency, uh, high throughput in terms of, of uh, bits per second. Um, so they have excellent uh, capabilities for, uh, I'll call it traditional SCADA type applications, for example. Um, however, uh, we felt the need and uh, we've seen a lot of interest in LTE solutions. Now actually 5G solutions are uh, very much in demand among utilities. We wanted to see what we could do uh, to support those requirements as well. So uh, that's the reason that we uh, sought out uh, an NB-IoT solution. So it was originally called LTE NB-IoT. That's still the term, even though this is now considered a 5G standard. Um, we felt that uh, although uh, this may have slightly um, lower throughput and longer latency, it has significant advantages for certain types of applications. So first and foremost, long range. Uh, and as you'll hear later, the range in the situation with um, the uh, uh, Jacksonville's uh, application is uh, a total of uh, 25 miles. Uh, and at that point, it's really limited more by the specifications in the spec than it is by the exact um, you know, RF power and uh, link budget situation. So very uh, long range. Uh, the system, because it's really designed for consumer type supports, it's um, uh, a situation where it uh, uh, can support uh, rapid provisioning, very high numbers, uh, and very low cost per, per remote. So AT&T, uh, Verizon, uh, T-Mobile, and really all of the um, worldwide operators are supporting this technology and uh, the critical infrastructure companies stand to uh, get the benefit of those massive use, uses of, of the system. So that's a big, big plus uh, uh, for this industry. It includes a number of security capabilities as well that are specific uh, to 3GPP and the, and the you know, intense um, amount of uh, protection those systems have been uh, engineered to include uh, the you know, prevention of hacking, that kind of thing, and gives uh, significant advantages. Uh, N equals one cellular reuse, that means you can reuse the same frequency in adjacent cells if you choose to do so, makes the deployment simpler. And, and then frankly, you know, there are just some companies that want to go with 3GPP, want to go with standards-based solutions. If that's your corporate policy, uh, then you know this this is a standard that that fits that requirement. So uh, for those reasons, we encouraged you um, to to take a look at this. Finally, um, wanted to mention that uh, after that decision, what did we do? Well, there, we don't have the technology uh, standards here at Select Spectrum, nor do our, the owners of the these licenses. These are these are investors that are looking to sell. But we were able to convince them to finance an RFP. Uh, through that RFP process, we selected Pololi. Uh, Pololi, as I mentioned, has done a, a great job on this. Um, the applications we were looking at in the RFP were, were essentially uh, for uh, situations where there would be wide deployment. Uh, you'll hear about what was actually selected. We were looking at things like pole top sensors and line fault sensors, distribution automation. Uh, and uh, DER, D Distributed Energy Resources. In fact, uh, some of these initial applications are different and it, it really shows the flexibility of this technology uh, and the fact that it can be used for uh, such a wide range. So we signed the agreement on uh, October 1st of 2018, 
by May of the following year, the system was in service in Jacksonville and Tallahassee. Uh, JEA was the original uh, initial customer. You'll hear more about their applications uh, very soon. And, and um, you know, it's not just the initial applications, but they're looking at a wide range. We certainly see that as the modules uh, hit the commercial market, as uh, more and more sensors and control de devices are built with these types of capabilities, that we think there'll be um, quite a bit more demand for LTE narrowband IoT. So thank you for this opportunity to present uh, the introduction today, and now we get into the really good part of the presentations. My name is Kimberly Trailer. I'm the Director of Network and Telecommunication Services for JEA. Today, I'd like to give you a brief overview of our NB IoT pilot in partnership with Select Spectrum and Paluli. JEA is an electric water and wastewater utility located in Northeast Florida. Our service territory encompasses about 1,200 square miles and four counties. Our telecom infrastructure encompasses 700 miles of fiber, about 40 communication towers, a mixture of licensed and unlicensed 900 megahertz radios for SCADA services, unlicensed 600 gigahertz point-to-point -point microwave links, and then we have a mixture in the cellular realm of IoT, meters, wireless routers, and our newest vehicle area network. We support services from our substations to our water and wastewater plants, our corporate offices to lift stations, and our field area networks. We also have about 3,700 concentrators and 35 collectors that make up our AMI network today, which we have partnered with Landis and Gear. So in 2019, JEA began working on with several pilot technologies to address an issue that has been plaguing us and many other utilities for some time. Over the years, we've built multiple ad hoc wired and wireless networks that are application centric and perform very specific functions. Today, we have a couple dozen networks that are mostly incompatible. As part of our considerations for the next generation digital grid, JEA began to look at LTE-based solutions, primarily because they were standards-based and they have the ability to provide the reliability, the latency, and the scalability we would be looking for in an IoT platform of the future. So today I've got about 28 disparate networks and going forward, we really wanted to take a look at things that were standards-based, interoperable, scalable, that would have a flexible design, be future-proof, and most importantly, secure. In our partnership with Select Spectrum and Paluli, we have put out an NB IoT pilot which is LTE based. We have leveraged our existing communication tower infrastructure and have installed Paluli Space Station, Radio Head, panel antennas, and endpoint sensors. Today, we have seen about a 25 mile coverage radius from these two towers. So in the future, to cover our entire service territory, we may only need to add two or three additional towers. The network was launched in June of 2019, and it is LTE 5G IoT standards. It is the first private LTE NB IoT or utility in standalone mode. We have actually been able to work on three different use cases. Our first use case was an ambient conditions monitoring use case that reported the temperature and humidity, and it was primarily used to establish the initial RF and connectivity links for the network. 
We had a data frequency of about every 15 minutes, and these were at five different locations around our service territory. The second use case was generator monitoring, and we were really interested in capturing some specific engine diagnostics as well as fuel. So we utilize the CAN bus interface on the generator and we're able to capture periodic event-driven engine vital statistics like oil pressure, engine speed, coolant temperature, etc. The data was captured in the on status and had a frequency of five minutes. This is very important to us, especially living in Florida where we have hurricanes. We test our generators usually once a month, and this information would allow us to understand what we would need to do for preventative maintenance at our communication sites. The latest use case was water pressure monitoring. So the current communications is through a sensor um, through the PLC on a SCADA gateway. And we did that as the, use that as the baseline and then included the NBIOT pilot communication. So that it would be the sensor over the NBIOT to our tower and then fiber backhaul to our OSI soft pie platform on the back end. We were actually able to determine that the data that we were capturing on our baseline data was off by 8%. So it performed very well. The frequency um, is approximately every two minutes, and we are getting comparable to carrier grade cell network reliability. The really great thing about this pressure monitoring is that it allows us to solve problems and for our boiled water alerts, it allows us to identify the leak and reduce the amount of time that our customers would need to boil their water. The other thing is in that immediate leak detection, it allows us a much um, to prevent the loss uh, much more of the infrastructure or damage to surrounding areas. Um, and then the other part of this is it allows us to monitor our water draw and use it for our consumptive use permits. And so with all of this, this feeds into our compliance and maintaining a less than 10% loss across the whole water uh, system. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. And if there are any questions, please send them. Hello, Region 3. My name is George Lucas. I'm with Paloli. I appreciate the introduction as well as Bob's and Kimberly's overview and introduction. So today I hope to provide additional detail to the Region 3 utilities about MBIOT, how it's implemented, some lessons learned, learned and uh, some comparisons between MBIOT and traditional PLC SCADA. So the Paloli team hopes that, first of all, we hope that everyone in the beautiful Southeast is staying healthy and sane during these trying times, including coming out of storm season, and hopefully we won't uh, get hit uh, this year again with any major storm. So Paloli is a network as a service company based out of San Francisco, offering fully integrated private LTE IoT networks to utilities and other critical infrastructure industries. I'm based in Raleigh, North Carolina, just a moderate drive from most of the member utilities within Region 3. So a little bit more about Paloli. The network is based on 3GPP's LTE 5G IoT standards, and it operates securely across license spectrum, le leveraging some of the benefits that, that Bob mentioned previously in his introduction. In today's update, I'll provide a little bit more detail about MBIoT, its history, and how it fits into the 3GPP architecture. Additionally, we'll provide a perspective on the global MBIoT adoption and specifically how it's being adopted in the US in the 700 megahertz band. We'll also explore confirmed use cases in detail that Kimberly mentioned. And again, as I mentioned, that side-by-side -side comparison of MBIoT and traditional SCADA. 
And then we'll also cover system architecture, channelization, and network design approaches. So what is MBIOT? As I mentioned, it's part of 3GPP standards and it's based on cellular radio access technology as specified by 3GPP. Together with CAD M1, MBIOT and those two technologies make up their specification for what is termed massive IoT, or in other words, a large number of IoT devices operating under a single network. Many domestic as well as international mobile network operators offer MBIOT and LTEM as part of their data or IoT services. So before uh, I dive into the specifics of MBIOT, let's discuss the differences between the two technologies. A key difference is spectrum requirement. MBIOT requires only 200 kilohertz of bandwidth per each or per up and down channel while CAD M1 requires 1.4 megahertz. So again, you know, looking at like the 700 megahertz upper A block, which is a one plus one megahertz band, it's optimized for that type of deployment. Both technologies, CAD M1 and MBIOT, provide mobility. However, of course, CAD M1 provides seamless mobility when roaming between towers, as well as higher throughput. Alternatively, MBIOT offers longer range deeper building penetration and has been optimized for battery power devices. So while, <clears throat> excuse me, while CAD M1 provides additional capabilities such as video, voice over LTE and higher throughput, it also requires higher bandwidth and higher power, thereby increasing IoT deployment costs. As utilities and other critical infrastructure industries move forward with smarter solutions, they can expand the reach of traditional distribution automation field area networks and provide new cloud and edge computing solutions based on MBIOT. So as I mentioned previously, MBIOT was standardized as part of 3GPP's release 13 in June of 2016. It's an industrial grade, low power, wide area network solution that runs exclusively or primarily on licensed spectrum, spectrum which again requires that quality of service and or provides that quality of service and future-proof capability. It's a cellular technology as part of the LTE family, providing that two-way communications. And again, uh, it leverages narrow bandwidth by typically exchanging data in small data packets. It's compatible with existing cellular network infrastructure with the same level of security as LTE. It's highly scalable and its ecosystem offers a wide range of low cost devices. It is designed to offer 20 dB coverage improvement versus GSM, which again allows for that longer coverage and improved building propagation. So MBIOT has not been static. Since the initial release in 2016, incremental 3GPP releases have improved the technology. In release 15, improvements provided power optimizing features such as wake up signaling, decreased data sizes, and early data transmission, as well as reinforcing the long range capabilities. And I think I just skipped over release 14, which of course was prior to release 15, that, that provided capabilities around positioning, multicasting, peak rate throughput, and mobility. Private MBIOT networks offer utilities connectivity where other cellular and mesh network technologies are not capable or available. They can replace, the technology can replace cancel lease lines to remote access to remote assets and can be optimized to the utility specific use cases uh, and applications. This provides monitoring and control of a range of utility assets while still meeting all the reporting and accounting requirement requirements mandated by utility commissions or other regulatory bodies. So while Pololi is focused on deploying private IoT networks for utilities and other critical infrastructure industries, it would be helpful to review the global adoption of MBIoT. As part of that large global standard, MBIoT has been adopted by a large number of cellular network providers. GSA, or the Global Mobile Suppliers Association, 
publishes industry reports on a regular basis and maintains a database of 4G and 5G devices, networks, technologies, spectrum, and chipsets. So this current report is uh, September of 2019, so which is now a year old, and we're waiting for the new report to come out. But in 2019, a year ago, uh, it showed pretty widespread adoption of MBIOT and LTEM. So the shaded areas of these maps are not really to indicate complete coverage, but instead highlight where there is significant IoT network activity. So going back to that report in 2019, there were globally 142 deployed or launched MBIOT networks uh, run by 114 operators. 153 operators are actively investing in MBIOT technology up from 141 in April of 2019, just five months prior. Of the global live and planned IoT networks, in total, as I mentioned, there are 114 different operators that have deployed MBIOT or LTEM in 57 different countries. Now, 27 of those countries have deployed or launched networks that support both MBIOT and LTEM. However, 28 countries have deployed or launched MBIOT only networks. And only two countries have deployed or launched LTEM only networks. <clears throat> Additionally, the GSA database shows that there are 26 commercially available chipsets that support either MBIOT or CAT M1. In that database, there are 303 devices, with over 60% of those devices consisting of modules. So, again, this enables a wide range of endpoints for that robust mobile module ecosystem. Out of the 303 total devices, over 230 support MBIOT. So when LTEM and MBIOT were first introduced to the marketplace, silicon vendors typically designed them together into one chipset. With the strong momentum for MBIOT, silicon vendors are now providing a wider range of MBIOT-only chipsets, which further decreases device cost and power consumption. From a market adoption perspective, a major milestone was reached in January of 2020 when over 100 million cellular MBIOT connections were established. Additionally, in 2019, there were a total, ship, total shipments of MBIOT devices racked up to 142 million, up from 53 million just the period the year before. Now, of course, 2020 is much different economically than 2019. Accounting for the pandemic, research from CounterPoint in August of 2020 this year shows, that it shows a 4% reduction in cellular IoT module shipments. However, shipments of LP WAN devices, which include MBIoT, increased by 51% in the second quarter of 2020. Some of this is in direct response to the pandemic. Quectel stated that they've seen an increase in MBIOT use case shipments like door status indicators and contactless temperature sensors. Transitioning back to the 700 megahertz MBIOT ecosystem in the United States, we're seeing a significant increase in production releases of chipsets and modules supporting 700 megahertz. The Pololi team is in various, sta various stages of interoperability and FCC testing with many of the top module manufacturers. These chipsets and modules accelerate adoption of private IoT networks within utilities and other critical infrastructure industries. The rapid growth of the chipsets and modules is enabling a new generation of low-cost, low-power, utility-managed endpoints supporting a wide range of applications, remote sensing, distributed energy resources, home gateways, smart city deployments, metering, and many others. And we'll share, I'll share some more about that as we look at JEA. Thanks to the MBIOT partner ecosystem, many LTE IoT devices are available from multiple vendors, allowing utilities to avoid vendor lock-in and take control of techno technology migration, including when to sunrise or sunset networks. So I think you saw in Kimberly's presentation a, a, a similar slide to this, the system architecture. 
So let's let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, the the Pololi Radiohead the system is software programmable from 450 megahertz to 2.1 gigahertz. Of course, we have operationalized it in the 700 megahertz upper A block currently. Uh, other frequencies, like the 900 megahertz frequency, needs to go through regulatory certification, and other bands are on the roadmap and can be accelerated based on project criteria. Deployed as a network as a service, Pololi provides all the hardware and software while working with utilities to leverage the utilities' existing towers and backhaul. So this reduces the, this approach reduces the utility's deployment effort to two key touch points. The API interface to the IoT platform or associated head-end systems, and then the endpoint installation. So Pololi works with utilities to identify current tower locations within their inventory or to identify uh, third-party tower locations that can be leveraged. And as I mentioned before, Pololi provides all the network hardware and software for the tower, which, can typ which typically consists of the antennas and remote radio heads, as well as the uh, base station with inside the uh, tower shelter. And then in, in that shelter, the two main components of that solution are the eNode bead and, and EPC, and they are, they are contained in a single 19-inch rack unit with a power module contained in a different uh, single rack unit. So an, an option with this deployment is the EPC can be hosted in the cloud or at a dedicated server farm for the utility, enabling a wide range of integration to different platforms, middleware components, and others. Uh, this integration and, and the communication to the endpoint can be conducted through TCP IP or UDP, and we'll kind of share what the benefits of that are in a later slide. For utilities that are considering a shared service or a service provider model, Pololi will stand up and operate the IoT network with endpoint installation being performed either by the utility personnel or a, approved third-party resources. So in Kimberly's presentation, she had, um, I think, the image on the right, which is the Jacksonville, Florida network. And that is two tower locations uh, that covers pretty much most of Duval County, which is kind of like a triangular shaped uh, uh, county. Um, and I think Kimberly mentioned that the JEA service territory is about 1,200 square miles. So the two MBIOT tower locations Pololi has deployed in Jacksonville is covering about three quarters of their service territory, at least from a coverage perspective. Now, as Kimberly mentioned, there may be additional towers uh, deployed over the near term to get extended coverage or to provide uh, capacity, additional capacity. So we have conducted some field testing on this network and that upper right tower on the right side is about 25 miles from that location to the Georgia border. So we've conducted some drive, drive tests where we had signal coverage and device communications all the way up to the Georgia border. Now on the left side of the image is the Tallahassee network. So this is a single tower location based in Tallahassee. It is not, uh, this is part of our partnership with Select Spectrum. And this location covers most of Leon County, uh, which is again, it's about 700 square miles. And we've tested that network deployment all the way down to the Gulf Coast, which is, uh, again, meets that 25 mile uh, standard or specification for MBIOT. So now this network, as I mentioned, isn't directly affiliated with utility. So it's very close and convenient to a lot of the region, region three utilities and Pololi and Select Spectrum would be open to a variety of testing scenarios for different devices in that, in that network. So building on the discussion that Kimberly had earlier about the traditional SCADA and MBIOT, on the left here is kind of the traditional SCADA stack where you have a sensor or control, control device that's connected to a programmable logic controller, which is connected, integrated through SCADA, typically through a short range wireless link to the tower location, but it may consist of multiple hops or at least multiple data transaction points in that whole hierarchy. So as we all know, SCADA can be a, a costly uh, deployment uh, initiative. It can require a lot of different hands from the utility involved in a deployment. 
And uh, sometimes, you know, it, the cost of the communication infrastructure is quite a bit higher than what uh, the sensor cost or control device cost will be. So on the right side is the MBIOT architecture, and it's pretty straightforward. It's the sensor connected to an endpoint, uh, which in the uh, in the JEA case is the RU700A device, which has a direct connection to the MBIOT tower. Again, that supports up to that 25 mile range. So the MBIOT sensor in this case can be installed quickly at the point of the measurement, either being continuously powered or through a battery, or, or powered through a battery. And uh, as we'll see in a moment in the J JEA MBIOT network, the sensor can be, as it connects through the tower and through the backhaul, can be connect, directed, connected through their fiber backhaul to the OSI soft Pi platform for side-by-side -side comparison. So one of the first use cases that we really found a lot of value out of this is that water pressure monitoring. And, it, and this is a scenario where it may be at a, a lift station, it could be some other location out on the network, um, but the, the MBIOT deployment really provides a small footprint uh, installation. And uh, you can see here in these images, this is kind of showing that side-by-side -side comparison. So on the lower left side of that image is a, is a picture of a, a, of a lift station building that of course inside of it has all of the PLC and SCADA hardware and capabilities in there. Uh, but what we've done on the outside of this to do a side-by-side -side comparison in that middle image with a, that is a backflow valve at the bottom of the screen there. And there is basically a simple T connector that goes into the standard fitting. Uh, so you can use off the shelf fitting hardware into one of the uh, adapters or connectors at the backflow valve. And in this case, we have two off the shelf pressure sensors mounted in parallel so we can do the side-by-side -side comparison of PLC SCADA and MBIOT. And in this instance, from an MBIOT perspective, the sensor costs more than the endpoint or the, the RU700A with the NEMA enclosure that's just mounted to the side of the building. Now, this does have power to it, but you see in the right side uh, image, that is the, the communications module, the MBIOT module, with the antenna uh, with a two wire connection current loop to the sensor. So it's a pretty low cost, straightforward installation. We're going back to the left side, as we know with PLC SCADA, uh, you have a dedicated Yagi antenna um, as well as all of the infrastructure inside of it. So another benefit going through this is when we do look at, it, even if we're adding sensors or control devices to existing SCADA locations, it, it, it typically involves wiring additional, laying of additional conduit or wiring or potentially even cutting concrete uh, to get the sensor connected into the SCADA system. For remote unpowered locations, the, the, the MBIOT device can be battery powered. Uh, and of course, that's one of the capabilities of MBIOT is the optimization for battery. So moving on, the other potential key use case we've learned here is the remote generator. And what you see on the right side is, is a, a lift station that has been retrofitted with a generator uh, in the event of a large scale uh, power outage. And uh, you can kind of see where the arrow's pointing. It has a dedicated PLC SCADA panel that when you look at the equipment in it can be thousands of dollars just in equipment cost. And again, uh, additional trenching and cutting required. Now, looking at this image, there is a load switch that was part of the generator install. And of course, trenching needed to be um, uh, performed to get that uh, device in there or th that key asset. Uh, but the, the switch itself contains a lot of the technology that is replicated or the, a lot of the capabilities that are replicated in the PLC SCADA panel. So because there's just a lot of redundancy that isn't, necess isn't necessary for deployment. So the, the MBIOT device actually installs inside of the generator. And in this case, we put a small external Yagi antenna on the outside of the generator. But in future iterations, we're gonna, you, we're gonna experiment with just the typical tilt 
our rubber ducky antennas and we think we'll get sufficient coverage out of a lot of that. So a lot of potential opportunities um, from both a pressure sensor and a remote generator capabilities. So lessons learned from this are pretty expansive. That low cost of deployment, additional capabilities that MBIOT brings to the table and the flexibility as well as being battery powered. And just to kind of bring this back to some of the uh, JEA use case, I think we heard Kimberly mention the uh, consumptive use permit. Uh, we've grown to appreciate that as a very uh, large lift as in Florida, as you may know, and, and many other states, water rights are reserved by the state government and, and are licensed on a permit basis. And that typically requires very extensive monitoring and data logging and reporting that can consume a lot of resources, both hardware as well as people resources in reporting and maintaining compliance to it. So MBIOT really offers a lot of capabilities there. And kind of building on this, the additional use cases, the additional capabilities that MBIOT can be applied include, you know, I mentioned the next-gen SCADA, but also next-gen AMI. And of course, when AMI, we're looking at that, uh, they're large scale and typically what we're looking for is for that technology to be integrated under glass. So I think we'll be seeing, uh, and we're, we're talking with some of the AMI vendors, I think you'll be seeing a lot of that capability come to the market here in the very near future. But going back to what we're talking about, the water use cases, gas is another one. You have a lot of remote assets that may not be energized. Uh, and additionally, uh, things like physical security or what I call system adjacency capabilities where the, we have a sensor or, or, or control device uh, at a facility and we can monitor if someone opens a gate or accesses the facility and uh, things like that. Then going to emergency management and, and environmental sensors, everything from temperature to uh, particulate uh, surveys to, to sensing if there's a, a fire in the vicinity, any number of uh, devices, again, going back that we can uh, pretty much deploy the COM module for about the same cost as the actual sensor, as opposed to what may be a 10 times cost for PLC SCADA. So moving, transitioning a little bit, we talked about the 700 megahertz capabilities. And I think Bob mentioned that in the region three, there's, uh, I think, one service area that that uh, license has been acquired and it's pretty much available for the other areas. And it's an ideal frequency spectrum for an MBIOT deployment. And the channelization structure of MBIOT supports uh, different technologies deployed within the same band. Again, MBIOT only requires a 200 kilohertz allocation per carrier and the 700 megahertz upper A block is a full one plus one band. So this could be any number of examples where you could have MBIOT only and you're, you're using multiple carriers for enhanced coverage and capacity, or you may deploy MBIOT for new and emergency use cases, uh, and that's complementing the proprietary technologies that the utility may already have deployed. And then a potential third scenario is a coverage overlay. So we'll kind of get into that a little bit more. So from a cellular design approach, and the network is design is based on established cellular practices using industry standard tools and methodologies. And uh, so this kind of example, let's talk through what is coverage and capacity. On the left side is a coverage centric design. Uh, this takes advantage of MBIOT's robust link budget and favorable single signal propagation at 700 megahertz. It also meets minimum service requirements, including extreme coverage levels. And it's typically a coverage centric design is typically characterized by an elevated antenna position and large intersite distances. A coverage centric design may be either sectorized or uses an omni approach. On the right side is a capacity centric design. It serves higher traffic profiles or denser areas of assets. Capacity centric design emphasizes the higher coverage levels, normals, normal or extended, and typically has smaller inner site distances or more concentrated cells. Capacity centric design usually uses a sectorized approach or alternative, al alternatively, a small omni underlay within the coverage area. In practice, 
the best design balances both coverage and capacity requirements. So when considering either a coverage centric or capacity design, there are a couple key parameters, the traffic profile per type of endpoint, which may consist of data size and frequency of transmit and receive, as well as the latency. And then of course, you want to we want to look at what is the endpoint distribution? What are the types of endpoints? What is your geographic distribution? And what is the timeline of deployment and expected service life of those devices, assets, and sensors? So within a private LTE network as a service, the design is optimized to each utility's needs. And of course, I'm happy to meet with any of the utility region three mem uh, member utilities and discuss any of their specific requirements. I'm just a short drive away. So thank you for your time. And I'll turn it over for uh, any follow-up questions or conversations. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.